Thank you, Dr. Sumitano, for the remarks. Uh, now, before, before we begin uh, the session, I would like to read a uh, short bio of our uh, presenter today, Dr. Satya Krihatizen, PhD, Program Director of uh, for Institutional Partnership at Yayasan Sigma. Satya Zen is a committed educator with diverse experience as teacher, school leader, and researcher. She started her career as a teacher in Jakarta and then moved to Aceh and worked there prior to her study in Finland. She recently completed her PhD from Ampere University, Finland researching about teacher identity construction in the context of the national teacher program between Indonesia and Finland. Okay. Uh, her research interests include teacher identity, narrative, qualitative research, resilient education, teacher education, teacher professional development, and educational technology. So if any of you have similar interests to your uh, research, uh, to Dr. Satya, to my contact her and discuss more. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, let me start the session. The first session would be the presentation. It will take uh, 40 minutes, 40 and 45 minutes for the presentation, and it will be followed by question and answer. Uh, question and answer session from the participants. So if you have uh, something to discuss related to the topic, identity, teacher identity construction, uh, you're welcome. Now we are going to do, uh, let me have uh, Dr. Satya for uh, presenting our research. Thank you, um, Mas Afan or Pak Afan. 
<laughs> for the introduction and thank you very much uh, Dr. Mamba for inviting me and thank you for doing triple uh, uh, the Faculty of Education uh, for providing this forum for me to share and to hopefully also to be able to learn from all um, so as um, but before we begin uh, I would like to ask if anyone has ever heard about uh, Sukhmabans and schools in Aji Oh yes, Baba Bang has, yeah. <laughs> has um, I think our um, our initial introduction was uh, when I expressed my interest to study uh, pursue my PhD and Baba Bang at that time was still teaching in uh, UPM, yeah, in Johor Bahru. Uh, so I was there and uh, I was still working in Aceh at that time. And um, Sukuma Bangsa School is a school that was built after the tsunami uh, in two thousand and six. And then now the schools are located in Aceh, but the foundation, Yayasan Sukma, is located in Jakarta. And uh, the foundation is actually under the auspices of Media Group, which is also organizing Media in Asia, Metro TV. So you probably, I saw the a sign that you had an event with King Andy a few months ago. So that's also part of um, Media Group. And that's also where we are. So that's a short introduction. And um, I would like to probably begin before about maybe asking, have you ever think about your own identity? Who am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> and then this is probably a question that has been asked a lot by a PhD students. What am I doing? <laughs> I mean, at least just recently graduated, so that's a question that I have all the time, <laughs> and that's normal, so don't worry. Um, so those questions is actually identity questions, and um, it is something that I think is very, um, I mean, I think now it's a healthy approach to think about your profession, like uh, when you're becoming a teacher, of course, you, you need to ask, like, who am I as a teacher? Yeah, what do I do? with this profession and then how I do it. So everyone will have a different way of answering it, but I believe that answering it is a way for us teachers to also become better teachers. And then later on, I will probably, during the introduction of the presentation, I will try to introduce the perspective, maybe theoretical perspective and also the methodological approaches used. If you are interested to pursue um, research in this field about teacher identity, but then also uh, approaches methodologically that you can use. And um, the example will be my own research that was um, conducted from 2017 until uh, well, 2017 and until 2023. So that's wrong. And then it's, um, it's a qualitative research. So then before, I think that's enough introduction for now. And so um, is it okay if I stand up here? Yeah, thank you. I think it's going to be much more, much more uh, dynamic as the title suggests. Right. Um, okay, so I have these, um, these are recent, very recent headlines uh, in newspaper about teacher. As you can see, I mean, I'm sorry for those who are probably not speaking Indonesian, but these are the two headlines about teacher. The first one is uh, uh, elementary teachers in East Jakarta only receive 300,000 for their salary, but in the receipt, it said 9 million. So quite a big difference. And then the second one, uh, junior high teachers in Medan crying because they got intimidated by the principal and their salary is not paid. So these are very hard, heartbreaking titles. These are recent titles from newspaper in Finland about teacher in Finland. Okay, this is in English. Probably what we notice about the differences between the two headlines. Yeah. 
Anyone? Yeah. Do you notice how the teachers are being, for example, portrayed in the lines? Yeah. What do you think? Well, the headlines in publication, for example. How do the teachers are portrayed in those headlines? Anyone? Oh, or trust. Yes. Teacher is is an agent in the first one or the second one? In Finland, yes. So in Finland, the teacher here are being asked for always they are being asked of their responses to various phenomena and how it is going to impact the world as a teacher or how it is going to impact their education in general. So and they have they are being asked for based on their expertise. So they are being acknowledged as an expert, as a professional. And so it shows in the way the newspaper treat them. And these examples are what we call discourses. So there are a lot of discourses about teaching profession, and there are social ones, political ones, there are personal ones. And um, what we see here is that discourse also influence our identity and how we respond to these resources will eventually decide who are we as so i'm not saying that we are being oppressed and we have no will and we cannot do anything there is room but there is big room there is small room and that depends on the context and that's room for negotiation is the one that we need to uh, to create. Yeah, either we create it by our community, or sometimes we need to create it by uh, policy. But there are more times than ever. I think in the context of school, we need to create our own space of negotiation. Um, so, what is teacher identity? Um, I will begin here by trying to, ex to explore what is the trend, what are the trend shaping uh, research on teacher identity, because this, this field is emerging. It's, uh, it's like an intersection between psychology, sociology, and there's also political, and of course, it's a, it's, it's a mix of all this. It's like the way I see it, it's, it's a huge forest, and you can enter it from different doors. But then um, I'm not saying that everything goes, but you need to have what you need to articulate in this is that you have to have a stance. So then that's for that to happen, you need to be aware of what are the and then also how to define your identity, which is very difficult because of what I described earlier. And then also I will probably give an example how I use teacher identity construct in my own research. And then why do I use this identity approach to study international teacher program, the context of um, the study and the research that I did. Now, there are several trends here. First is that and they need to be understood as not as object, but as a subject. So they are agents. They have agency to do, to do something about how they're going to shape their practice and then how they're going to respond to policy. And that's a special identity. And then the second one is that um, there is an increased interest in the world. So teaching is also include all of those things. And then in a lot of ways, sometimes the question of emotions is probably not really addressed, for example, in teacher ed, professional development. Sometimes we only talk about the technical skills, competences, but sometimes we forgot to address the emotions. How do you feel? What do you think? How do you feel uh, regarding these practices? And then how do you see your students' emotions regarding the processes in the school? So these things also shape the trends toward 
more interest in teacher identity research. And then also there is uh, passion, commitment, and courage. Those are very abstract things, very difficult to define, very difficult to measure sometimes. Maybe there is a way to measure it, but it felt during interaction and then it's always present in the classroom. And then the, set, the last one, the trend to see teacher expertise rather than always gaining more competences and skills, but rather to see it not as a linear accumulation, but rather to see it as a, something that they can reconstruct throughout their career. So it's an awareness that you can change. It's an awareness that you can learn something new. It's an awareness that you can you can be different in your teaching. So this, this is a very flexible way and very fluid way to respond to different um, maybe assumptions that we have before about what is teacher expertise. Sometimes we see that those who are probably already going through so much training or already have a master degree in something, that they're probably the expert. They might be theoretically, yes, they have more knowledge, but whether this knowledge will be useful in their teaching, whether it's going to shape how they relate to their students and how they will make pedagogical decisions, that is actually the question of identity. Now, this is one way I think I've been using this uh, visual a lot because I found this visualization capture all these different dimensions from teacher identity. For example, that professional identity is also shaped by perception, images, meanings, and self-knowledge. So these are the four perspectives that probably use as approaches, theoretical approaches to, um, to construct or to research for teacher identity. And based on that, so we can see that we can focus on the individual, for example, if you want to see the characteristic, whether it's personal or psychological, but we can also see how teacher identity is being constructed through interactions. In this, the processes is interpretation, reinterpretation, or integration. And then the last one is also during the education process. So what sort of experiences and relationship that shape teacher identity during their educational processes? So these are the different level of how you can, for example, if you are interested to see what is the effect of teaching in inclusive schools on teacher identity. So you can see whether you want to check it at the individual level, or you want to approach it from the interactional or the educational. So these are the different ways how this identity can be used as a framework, as a framework to frame the phenomena that you're interested in. And um, of course, the last one, there is environmental factors, as always. Um, this two discourses, for example, what sort of newspaper headlines that are around, those are also representing social discourses about teacher profession. And also what sort of, uh, for example, stories you've heard when you say that I'm a teacher, what sort of responses you have, those are social discourses. And there's also the political discourse, for example, how do the government uh, frame their policy regarding teacher? How are they being recruited? How do they define criteria of good teachers? Those are political discourses, and that's shaped teacher identity. So this is a very useful visual, and if you're interested, you can also use this as a starting point. Now, According to Ackerman and Mayer, based on those trends and the, the visualization that we saw earlier, so we can see that professional identities is always a process of reinterpreting of who you are. Uh, practical example of this is that we experience new things every day. If you are now a second year student, you are probably previously a teacher in one of the elementary school, and now you are a student, um, master degree student. So you are experiencing new experience as student, and you are 
reinterpreting who you are as a teacher. And probably in a lot of your work in the courses forces you to reflect on what sort of decision that you did and you're being questioned whether this actually have a pedagogical basis and then you're being questioned about who you were before and what am I going to do about this now? Now that I know this, how am I going to react moving forward? In that sense, you are recreating what you want to do. So, and then the last one, con person and context are implied. Yes, uh, we cannot create our identity without this influence of our surroundings. So our context is very important, but there is also agency. You can do something about it. There's also room for negotiation. And then this third one, sub-identities or positions are embraced. So that means teacher identity is not like fixed entity. I'm one way. I'm very disciplinary and there's no room for other be there's no other there, there's no room for me to be otherwise. So this positioning is also something that I use in my research, and later on we can discuss it in more detail. But I think you have a tendency to be someone. You project your person and your identity as someone. But then there is also room to change. And there is also room for you to react differently. So this is what it means by positioning yourself differently in different situations and when you encounter different person. And the last one, agency is essential element in teacher identity. Yes, that means you decide. Whether you want it or not, whether you realize it or not, you always decide who you want to be. Now, in this study, in my study, teacher identity construction is a dynamic process. And I'm using narrative. Narrative is one of the discourse, the type of discourse. For example, when you tell I'm a teacher, I teach in elementary school, and I'm a type of teacher who likes to interact with children and I like my children to have the freedom. So this is actually your narrative about who you are. Yeah, so I'm using that and also teacher identity construction in this sense that it is dialogical. That means I will always in dialogue with my context, with my past, with who I'm in, encountering with. And then so it's a dialogical process. So Dialogue means you go both ways, so it is not one way. So you're not only being objected to something, but you can react and do something about that. So that's knowledge. Now, the second one is that this construction is a narrative process. Through narrative, you tell us who you are, you create stories about who you are, and we do it all the time. For example, you went home last time to your hometown and meet people who you haven't met for a long time. And then you have to tell them what you're doing in Italy. Essentially, you are creating a narrative about you as Ui3 uh, students. And then you're also projecting this identity to your community in your home. So these are the process of creating narrative identity. And then um, identity is constructed through dialogical negotiation. Yes, in interaction, we are always being positioned by other people and we are always positioning ourselves. For example, you went home to your hometown and you're suddenly saying, I am a graduate student in Ubi you are positioning yourself as a postgraduate student. And then you start to behave, you control or you monitor your behavior based on your assumption. What is graduate students of UE3 supposed to look like? Right? So you suddenly do this, all this image, image uh, control, <laughs> or you're probably remaking yourself into becoming someone who's probably different than who you were before. So that's an identity process, and that's a management process. And your friends are probably also wondering, oh, ah, so he's a different person now. After he went to Ui3, now he's becoming smart. 
is becoming, you know, so all of these images about the UE3 students are now attached to you as a person. Yeah, so that is a process of a narrative identity construction, and then you're using your positioning as UE3 as a postgraduate students, along with all the other imagination that attached to that position. And that's similar to teachers. For example, when I say Guru Honor, what comes to your mind? Susi? Ah, small salary, oppress, the object of uh, object penderita. Yeah? So all these images are attached to that one identity. And whether you really realize it or not, whether we want it or not, we have to negotiate with those positioning. Yeah? And a lot of times we don't see that there is room for you to decide otherwise. Because the room is usually non-existent, it is very small, and sometimes you have to fight to create that room. Now, so uh, dynamics in this study is referring to the processes that produce the changes in teacher identity. So my study is trying to identify what sort of processes that happening when someone is trying to recreate their identity, reconstruct their identity. And there are, based on this narrative assumption, I will, I will and biological assumption, I will describe later the dynamics of biological repositioning, yeah, biological negotiations that I will um, highlight later. Now the, okay, the last one, teacher identity construction, then it refers to a narrative interpretation. So how do we create stories about who you are? And then how the identity is constructed in this context. So narrative is the medium. It is the tools you use to create who you are. Yeah, so it's a very powerful tool. If you are using social media right now, there are lots of stories there. And it's shaped how you think, whether you realize it or not. It positions you differently, whether you want to be positioned that way or not. So that's why they always said that social media is has its dark side, yeah? because stories seep through, and you don't realize that you are actually already influenced by it. Whether you deny a particular story or you affirm, you engage with the stories. Yeah. Sometimes you don't realize them. Now, this is the conceptual framework that I use. Yeah, so there is the narrative identity construction in our mind, and there is the logical process, and there is positioning and repositioning. And then you construct reality using narrative. On your mind. And we do this all the time. So according to Brunner, we construct the identity narrative. Now, teacher identity from this perspective, then I'm using two-level analysis. So I'm focusing on the micro level. And then also at the meso level, the second level is where the experiences heighten their awareness about teaching profession. Teaching as a profession you as the teacher. So there is a micro level or is a meso level. Now, the context of the study, so there is this one program, an international teacher program between Finland University and Yayas and Sukman, which was conducted in 2015 until 2017 in Aceh, Indonesia, and in Tampere, Finland. So I was working in Sukma Bangsa School, the implementer, of the program, and I was coordinating the program from 2015 to 2016. Um, the program participants are the teachers from Sukma Bangsa schools. There are 30 of them. And um, the schools in Indonesia, which is Sukma Bangsa schools, as I mentioned earlier, it's located in Aceh. It has a post-conflict in a post-tsunami 
context, and then this also plays out into the narratives of the region. And also, of course, influence their identity and speech. Now, in my literature review, this is something that is, uh, I art on last night for thinking like, okay, so people will be asking what are the difference? How the teacher identity is being constructed in Kenya and how it is constructed in Indonesia. So this is based on some scholars who already did their research. And there are some of the things that I, I think struck me first is that in Finland, at least the teacher education from the very beginning is already oriented toward teacher identity, which is specifically teacher as researcher. So it's an orientation. The teacher is prepared to have a research orientation. It's, that doesn't mean that they conduct research, no, but it's like they have an, a way of approaching problem and then try to solve it empirically and using literature to help them making pedagogical decisions. So it's an orientation. It's not like they're becoming research. And then the second one is that there is a very wide room of autonomy. So it is also because related to how the curriculum itself is being constructed in Finland. Uh, so they require teacher who can make decision on their own, sound decision on the spot, because the curriculum is very loose. So teacher and schools are the one who create very specific curriculum for that school, for their students. So as you can imagine, the autonomy is very big. The comes with this autonomy is also responsibility. And also the, I would like to say the obligation. It could be obligation, but it also responsibility for the teachers to be prepared to assume this autonomy. So it is both the obligation of the government, but there's also the responsibility of the teacher to prepare themselves to assume the autonomy. So that's logical. And then the, second, the last one is that the teacher are independent, responsible professionals, and they develop their work and evaluate it from various social and ethical perspectives. So they really need to see the context. What is the implication of their decision-making in the classroom regarding particular students? They need to understand where the, the students come from, how is it going to affect the students and the community where they are from. So that's ethical. Now, in Indonesia, there are several uh, scholars who already did some research on teacher and um, some of them are describing teacher identity as mainly associated with strong state institution. As we know, there is a civil servant teacher identity, for example, that is very prevalent. And then there is also, now, interestingly, in 2005, there's a teacher law that was implemented, and it is highlight this, uh, the law, emphasize that teaching is professional. So there is, a, there is an effort to distance themselves from the civil servant identity with those as a professional teachers. However, I think I'm quoting Abu Hori here to describe that. What, the, what does it mean by being professional? So it, there is a need to, to really um, as we can see that this term probably have a very different connotation, our context, and it is interpreted differently, for example. Those who I see being professional teacher, probably you can earn some professional um, yeah. so incentive, yeah. So there is different way how this term professional can be interpreted. And so that's why the term professional teacher probably experienced a, a narrow way of, of its intended uh, by the regulation. 
in the practice, this become a more narrow. Now this is, we go back to the study. So this is the methodological approach that I'm using. So it's a narrative approach, qualitative research. I do a narrative interview with 13 of the participants. I do it in 2017 and then I again in 2019, two years after they graduated. So I went to Aceh and have another conversation and to see whether they, they did identity, more identity after they graduated. And Yes, of course, it's a growing process. So, as we all do, we also reconstruct our identity already. Now, I'm using thematic narrative analysis and positioning analysis. Positional analysis, as I described earlier, in one, for example, how I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing a positioning. I'm an academic. I'm an I'm a program director. So that's a positioning way of you're positioning yourself every time in your interaction, whether you realize it or not. So now the dynamics, okay, these are the findings. So now what is the dynamics of teacher identity in the context of international teacher program where I did my research? Now there is what a term that I use uh, is called biological repositioning. So internally, micro, I'm repositioning myself all the time. In interaction, I'm repositioning myself all the time. But what I'm focusing on is the internal repositioning. So I'm listening to their stories and then I'm trying to see how are they positioning themselves in their stories. And then how do they position others? in that story and how do they be positioned by others in that story so there is always this three three positioning levels that i'm trying to identify all the time from the participants and then every repositioning includes dialogical examination so if you are repositioning to be someone that is higher sometimes someone that is blue, then this will imply you do a dialogical examination of that prior positioning. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Now, and there are three mechanisms that I identify in their narrative that might support this teacher identity. First one is the construction of narrative space. The second one is that the increase of narrative capital in terms of you have more positionings. Last one is that you are repositioning yourself based on evolving plots. For example, using your prior story about being a postgraduate student in Wuhan. So in a sense, your plot is changing from one as a teacher to as a student, postgraduate student. So your plot is evolving. And then you are changing your position along that. Now, why is this important? Sometimes you're still using the same plot. You don't realize that you change your plot. If you're no longer a teacher, you're currently a postgraduate student, and you don't realize it. So you still carry the same positions. And what is the implication? So maybe you will complain when you get a lot of coursework. Who knows? I'm not trying to say that you are, but maybe. You see? So this positioning is important to have awareness that you no longer live in the previous one. You are using a different form now, and you have to reposition yourself. So then you also be ready to assume to do new things to explore new things, and to act differently. The second one is the increased narrative capital. Narrative capital has a lot of, there are, di there are different capitals. Uh, positioning, another one is, for example, scenarios. For example, one of the prevailing scenarios of teaching and learning 
You probably have prior scenarios about teaching and learning in higher education from your previous teaching uh, training experiences in another institutions. For example, in my previous institutions, I cannot address my professor using their name. Those are scenarios. But then in Finland, for example, when I address my professor using their full names, they were like saying, no, 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 that's not, you can call me by my name. So that's a different scenarios. Yeah. And these different scenarios are kind of duplicative. Why is it important? Because scenarios also sometimes determine positioning. For example, in Finland, the position is more equal. I can address my professor using their names. So it carries different way of interactions. So there are wider implications of why the scenarios in some settings might not work in another place. Now, the third one is the construction of monetary space. So this is considered to be something that is probably um, original, I hope. Now, this is the findings all in one visual. So there are different disordered narrative identity construction in your head, and there's a narrative space involving plot and narrative as the mechanism, the ones that help you to construct your stories and who you are in the process. And then you narrate this, you tell the stories. You tell the stories of your experience, but at the same time, you're actually telling the stories of who you know. Now, the construction of narrative space. In the research, a lot of the students, the participants, are saying them, calling themselves Billy London. And there's one here, Ibu Susan. She is actually one of the participants of the program. So they call themselves Billy London. Birlander is an acronym from Biren, the place where the school is located in Aceh, Finland. Yeah. And as suffix and R, yeah, like Netherlander or something. So it's Birlander is a non-existent country that they create on their own. Yeah. But this Birlan is actually a narrative space. It is created in imagination, but it represents something. What does it represent? It represents that there is a merging of Indonesian and Finnish context in their head. Some features from Indonesian and Indonesian context, some features from Finnish context through their interaction with Finnish educators, but also through their interaction in Finland when they visit. So all of these are merging and created this one space, which is not different. Yeah. Now, so what does it do? It has function. It's organized characteristic, for example, as I mentioned earlier, yeah, about features in Indonesian context and features in Finnish context. Even though in the way they're selling it, sometimes they're using compare and contrast. A lot of the narrative goes like this. In Finland, I see the teachers, they don't have a lesson plan. I have to create lots, five pages of lesson plan. There are multiple space of functioning. There are features of Indonesian, accent, Finnish, all in the country. So there are a lot of stories like that. And it is very common for those visitors who visit Finland or a prominent country. They're using this type of narrative in Harrison and Bertrand's. Now, the repositioning, repositioning took place in this unified space. Case in point, for example, this teacher who was questioning about the lesson planning, they, he decided, okay, um, maybe I, I didn't really do it because sometimes I'm just talking in plastic. At least he's honest. 
But then when he said, I think this problem is very important, but I need to be more potential with it. So what happened there is that his repositioning from a teacher who copying and passing his lesson planning to someone who's going to do lesson planning with intention. That's repositioning. So that's one possibility. But then another one is that the bar, the Vinland as an animal space. So that's also include diverse elements. Yeah. And at time, sorry, at times it might be contrary. So it's not always like easy to reposition. Okay, I'm going to be a teacher who will plan something with intention. It doesn't always work like that. Some teachers actually refuse, right? That's it. I don't want to make lesson planning anymore. I don't want to do it five pages. That's too much. It doesn't make sense. I don't want to do it that way. It could be. And what happened when they go back to school, the principal was acting weird. So he has difficulty and experience contradiction and conflict because of this repositioning. Okay? So it's not always the same. Now, um, the second one is narrative capital. I will really discuss this. And I think one of the most important points from this is that new positions are associated with significant shift. So there is a shift in the way you're looking at yourself and the way you're looking at the issues in reference. So this repositioning is also um, stimulating a shift in perspective. Now, and there is a position in the evolving thoughts, and I will describe this earlier. So I think the last one is that, oh no, this is it's not the last one. If you're interested more to know more about what I'm describing here, you can also see the populations here. Yeah. It's all open access. Yay. <laughs> so feel free, download, read, and you can also ask me later if you have questions. Now, what is the theoretical contributions of this research? So that identity reconstruction in this perspective, at least, it is a pure as an process. So you need to recreate stories about who you are as a teacher. Yeah. Consciously includes more new positions. And you might you might change who you are. Okay, and the second one is that. Narrative process is important. So it is not only about gaining new knowledge, being able to do new skills, but it also to create a story that, okay, who is this person who knows these things? Who can do these things? Who is that person? So reflection is important. Yeah? And the function of narrative. I will highlight that simply. This is the empirical contributions if you're using this perspective um, for international teacher program, for example. For those who are interested to study abroad and have an international experiences, it will force you to examine your value and your belief. And it is probably something that previously you don't even aware of that. And then the second one, few differences as something that is enriching, not something that will. So the, the way of thinking is that if there is something new and different, try not to use or A or B. It's a binary way of doing it. Try to say A and B. So it could be both. It is a much more simple looking. And then the last one is that, well, in all international teacher programs, so there is a need for more supports and understanding, and there is a need to create a space where they can recreate their identity, to construct new meaning, to create new stories about the world. Acknowledge that. And I think in this context, 
put up, put it three years in the international space. So this is something that we probably also need to look at. Now, what are the implications for Indonesia? So these are some things that probably will influence all of their educations in general. So not only Indonesia. So um, the first one is that when you see teacher identity not something as fixed, it's not something that will be created once and then that's it. But you see it as something fluid, continuous, it's a process, then you're becoming more understanding about the possibility of change, the possibility of growth. And then the second one is that there is a wider, there is a need for more diverse context, wider and diverse. So, for example, in international teacher program, by the nature of the program, they are going to be immersed in two different contexts. But maybe if you're studying locally in Indonesia, for example, you can recreate this wider context by including formal and informal education, for example. So do you teach your practical in these two institutions? That's one example. The second one is probably also more collaboration in schools. So during the practice teaching, the student teacher can have more meaningful engagement right, with the context where they practice their teaching. So there are ways to recreate this wider and diverse context during teacher education. And there are four categories here. Maybe you can read it later. And then the last one also, there is a shift in teacher education from accumulating competencies to activating these competencies. What does that mean? So yes, you still do have to know more. You have to learn. You have to be able to do things. But there is also a need to help these future teachers to recognize what am I going to do with those skills? How am I going to use it in my practice teaching? How is it going to shape my pedagogical decisions? So those are the things that probably we need to be more highlighted and emphasized in our future education. Now, in the context of Aceh, this is where the another conflict between Indonesia and Finland, Indonesia is in Aceh, there is also post-conflict and post-disaster context. Um, one, of the, one of the prevailing impact is probably on the teaching and learning scenarios in that context. For example, the way discipline is implemented. Earlier in Dr. Nam's office, I described my first teaching in Aceh, and then the parents were very encouraging for us to use punitive discipline. And that's something that is really now in Indonesia, we don't accommodate those kids anymore. I think that discipline using force measure, violence, is something that is also um, like the, it's an impact on post context in the region. So that's one of the ways the silent impact that probably not here us, but it influenced the classroom interaction in a day-to-day -day basis. And then there is also the, there is a need to acknowledge that we do have this history and it needs to be acknowledged and it needs to be addressed. So then there is, a, there is a need for teacher education, for example, in that area, which I know that they already start doing since after the MOU is being signed, there are efforts to include that peace education. And also, for example, we have a management conflict prevention system. So then we implement peace education, peace culture, how to create peace culture in the schools. So there has to be a clear efforts and also um, in like a policy level in the school that will work with the interaction day-to-day decision. So then, that's the end of the presentation. 
So I hope you're not falling asleep. I know this is a very difficult hour after lunch. So um, yeah, and I think now we can continue with the question and answer. Oh yeah, okay. Thank you, terima kasih. Kitos is thank you, Nash. Kitos. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Zambia. Uh, it's very comprehensive uh, presentation about the future energy construction in the context of uh, Indonesian Program Teacher Program. Um, uh, if I may conclude to in one line that uh, the program uh, employed uh, uh, three mechanisms of teacher identity construction, uh, which of course is a, a construction construction of a narrative space, then increasing narrative capital, and then repositioning through evolving plots of uh, teacher identity. Now uh, let let's move to the question and answer session. The first session I will give up to three. Okay, we have three, and then uh, mention your uh, name, uh, faculty, and program. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, I'm Dr. Hakim, based in education. Okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, presenters. I'd like to ask about uh, the definitions of the uh, call. Uh, you have mentioned about the teacher's identity, but I haven't heard any explanations about uh, does, uh, could you please elaborate more, what does the teacher's identity stand for? Is it the identity of them as a professionals or as a person who are working as teachers? Because your methodology of uh, to collect the data of your issue is about narrative. It's, it tends to be like more personal because this teacher has their own story about um, being a teacher. For example, maybe I am a farmer, then, sorry, my parents did well, so I'm a farmer, and also a teacher, for example. So, can you explain more? Is that uh, represent them as professions or as an individual who are uh, working as teacher? So, thank you. Yeah, next question. Maybe the closer one first. <laughs> Mention your name and uh, I don't think. Okay. Uh, thank you for the time. I'm Dr. Nibu, I am Adi Wisma uh, from PhD. Uh, I'm curious about um, the methodology trial approach uh, and your research and um, you in advance for your presentation and I learned a lot. Um, since we are, me personally, sometimes still wondering what to do with the methodology in our research. So my question is, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, you conduct three years of uh, observation, right? from 2017 uh, up to 2019 to 13 participants. Is that correct? So, it's actually the interview is conducted twice and the observation is not ongoing all the time. But it's like, since I was coordinating the program, so then I was able to observe during the implementation and post-graduation, I was not able to observe all, but only I spent about one to two months in Ajay. Um, so, uh, that's, why, that's my question, actually. Okay. Oh, to manage this participant. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, can you please? Thank you. My name is Nasrullah. Uh, I'm from a student uh, in education. I have some questions for you. The first one, uh, you stated that your research is take, is take a long, is to a long time. 
So uh, what what makes a uh, religious peace takes a long time? And then the second question is about the gap uh, in Indonesia in Finland. I know that you are master of this because you have studied Finland, of course. So I want to know the the gap in terms of curriculum or the way of teacher teaching in Finland and also in Aceh because also you said you say you say that you all already stayed for a long time in Aceh. And then the third question is. Uh, do you think that identity of teacher can be changed a while, uh, I mean, can alter? Uh, how many percent that can, can you say how many percent that the teacher can be changed their identity itself? And how about the teacher who has uh, in uh, introvert uh, and because the introvert person sometimes cannot be changed themselves. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, we will have Dr. Sabia to uh, give answers to those questions. Thank you. Uh, all very interesting questions. <laughs> um, and then, um, yeah, the the question, I think the first one about teacher as professional or teacher as personal, it is something also that I, when I was a teacher, I'm struggling also with this question. Because who you are as a teacher and who you are as a person, I think is a very difficult, it's very difficult to be separated. You teach who you are. If you, this, is, this is something that I read, I think it's written by Parker or something. So you is uh, his book is very good if you want to read it. It's the courage to teach. So according to him, you teach who. So it's it's not something that you you can you can you know put it in the the door and before you enter the this, the your house and you're someone else. So um, your question is actually something that is also very um how to say it uh, it's a philosophical question who you are as a teacher is also who you are as a person so when i did my research i think i i i did initially trying to separate like whether this is a personal stories or it is related to professional stories experiences in teaching and all that and then in the end i realized it's all part of who they are because uh, if you remember from the diagram, so there is a personal and there is psychological and there is interaction and there is education process. So it is all part of the part of the big puzzle that makes who we are as a person. The trick is, as a researcher, is that you need to create boundary. Are you going at the micro level, or are you going at the meso level? Or are you going to research about how teacher discourses in policy, for example, how their identity, teacher identity is being defined in policy? So there are different ways how you can you can approach this. And that's why the there is no fixed definition about what is teacher identity. It depends on who you ask. And it depends on from what perspective the researcher is talking. So my perspective is I'm constructivist. I believe that we construct our identity and it is also through narrative. So as a researcher, you need to know your science first. And that's probably why you need to read a lot, conduct your literature review, because then you you need to be able to articulate your stance. You create the door. So I hope this satisfies. Or it's probably making you more confused. I'm sorry. Um, the second one is about uh, metrology. Yeah, I think in my research, um, this. Theoretical and methodological is, is intertwined. I'm, I'm, I'm using narrative, so then narrative is 
narrative is another term that is difficult to define because it is also a way for you to um, yeah to gather data narrative interview for example but it is also an it is both a verb and a noun that's the easy way to define it it's a noun for example if you create stories about this these stories that's or as we see earlier about uh, newspaper items that can be considered uh, as a verb you can now interview narrative interview so that's a verb okay. so then this becomes my also not only my theoretical but also my pedagogical approach um the third one uh, you have to question, answer all. <laughs> well, uh, why so long? Why indeed? <laughs> I do question that myself. Uh, well, it's one one thing after another because in in Finland, for example, uh, we have two ways of of writing the format of the dissertation. There are two ways how you can do it. First is the monograph, which is a big book that you're probably familiar with. The second one is by publications. That means you, uh, I'm taking the second one. So I'm, I have to publish a minimum of three, three to five of article in peer review journal. Uh, and then I would, need to create what we call uh, integrative chapters. Um, it's another smaller book that will uh, synthesize the findings from the three articles. So what took so long is that uh, when I, I did my PhD and I was starting to submit my article to journals, COVID-19 happened. And then suddenly, all the peer review process is being delayed, and they have difficulties finding the viewer, and I have difficulties trying to write <laughs> on my own. <laughs> so when everything is closed, but um, that's that's the context. But then um, the decision that I decided to do at that time was that okay, I will continue writing, and I will continue submitting. And, uh, regardless how long it will take, and one of these days someone will will feel sorry for me, <laughs> and then eventually publish. But no, it's not. Um, it it goes through revision process that is quite long, and I learned a lot during the revision process. The reviewer are quite constructive. Yes, that's a good way to say it. I am quite constructive. They're very, very constructive and informative, and but yeah, so that's a, that's another story. So anyway, that's why it took so long. And um, well, yeah, I mean, it takes as long as it needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to. <laughs> so that's. It takes as long as it needs to take. And there is no way for you to speed it up. There is no way for you to uh, prolong it. It takes as long as it needs to take. So that's all I can say about duration at this moment. <laughs> um, the gap between Indonesia and Finland. Ah, OK. Um, I think. I mean, every every country will have their own way of organizing their educational system, and one way is probably deemed to be better than the other. Those who this and it's uh, who decide which one is better than not uh, than the other is uh, always questions of uh, well, there's always someone who are not satisfied with it, but. Finland, as it happens, they gained their um, certification after PISA 2000. And um, 
even Finnish person, they don't realize that they have a taboo. So in a lot of uh, reaction or uh, from the Finnish person, usually when they are being asked, they they will say that no, we don't really, we didn't realize it at that time. So then this also becomes um, something that uh, makes them reflect actually. So they they also reflect on what did we do and how did we do it. And it's it's a it's a process for them to to learn and to understand why do people are very interested. There are some features, and I'm sure there are books that are written volumes about this. Um, but I think come I come to an understanding that um, if you go to another country and you want to you, you want to learn their education system, one of the I think the, the best strategy for you to have is that everyone has their own journey. Yes, there are fundamental things that has to be in place in terms of facility, quality, or teachers, all that. But then I think if you don't go beyond that, then you will fail to understand and learn. Um, and then in a lot of times, I think people will start blaming. So that is also not a good position to have. What we need to maintain is some, some room where, okay, yes, we acknowledge all these weaknesses and these drawbacks and all this. Some There are things that are not working at the moment, but since the school is still online, learning process will happen every day. So we need to also do address something at that level. Interaction with the student, teacher, and learning process. So the gap here, if you want me to articulate the gap, <laughs> that's very difficult. <laughs> because uh, it's, I don't want to go into comparison to either or. Uh, but we do need to acknowledge our weaknesses, things that we need to improve. And the question is, how are we going to address it at the micro level? Where the learning process is happening in the time. So that's, I think, is the bigger, the bigger gap that we need to address. And um, can identity change? Well, what do you think? Have you changed at all? Huh? Do you stay the same? Yeah. If we experience change, then we do need to have the um, the assumption that people will change. Identity can be changed. The question is how and whether we want to change. And it is it's it's not as simple. As it seems. If I, but it's, if you ask specifically about teachers, in my case, the answer can be yes and no. First, whether they can change if of an agent and if they have the room, or they can create the room space for them to change. But the answer is no if there is no room to change. Are positioning themselves as agent, or they're not being positioned as agent. But there is always room for change. It is always there. And then the last one, how many percent? Well, that's difficult to say. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's been so long since I have to quantify things. So <laughs> I think you need to ask about Mula. <laughs> and then uh, introvert, extrovert. There are ways to categorize different features, characteristics. And um, extroversion and introversion are one way to, to do it. And it could be something that um, and there is also one one category ambivalent. That means you can be both, 
depending on the situation. So I think this type of categorization, it is it can be useful as long as you're not being trapped by it. You know, you can keep saying, oh, I cannot do it because I'm an introvert. Then you're trapped by, it, by this category. So the, the key here is that whether you want to grow from a previous position, do you want to make a change yourself or not? So, I hope this is a Yes, you Maybe one more or two. Okay. We'll give two. First, yeah. Like, um, my name is Simon Lukman. I'm from an English student. Uh, in the case of some school that have a uh, good school environment, some internet in person challenges and being embraced by, maybe by the other teachers and the yes, students. And can we say that uh, the teacher says the crisis? So can we say that the teacher being has on uh, teacher crisis in the beginning? And how can how can the teacher measure the crisis? Next question, please. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting research. I'd like to, uh, I'm more interested in the context of my research. I don't know because my background is in teacher education. I want to know the role of uh, very university and also my super school. What kind of work that you share and uh, the participants involved in your study are they were they uh, research teachers and what kind of what kind of actually what kind of program did uh, both institutions uh, this was that's very interesting and very challenging also. thank you so much. So sorry. And your I'm, I'm thinking I am a scholar of the faculty of education. Okay. Um, ah, okay. This is a very interesting question about oppression. Yeah, and I do have to acknowledge that uh, we do have different, there are some situations and contexts where it's very difficult to express your identity, to construct your identity. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, it's all up to you. you know, there is no such thing. And um, acknowledging this context means also that maybe in the beginning, just knowing that you can do something different it is in the awareness itself it's already something that is in our brain because then that means you are aware that you can be different even though at that point maybe you cannot do differently yet but then that you already have the awareness and i think this is something that uh, if you are reading about victor frank for example the meaning of purpose so that is something that is also very um in his perspective, you, you can have that freedom in your mind first. And then later on, that will help you to preserve who you are. So even in the most difficult context, and I'm saying I'm not saying that everyone has it easy, the most important is having the awareness first and maintaining it. You know, either you can you can write it down in your journal, for example, or you can sort of like create it another community where you can express your identity. So those things that you can do, you can search for other teachers to have similar ideals, you know, like you, for example, and me outside of the school or after school. So those are also ways that you can circumvent. And um how to get out of it. Well, that's that's what some ways. Another one is that in, in addition, in alternative way to, to see your identity construction, there is also what we call identity fusion. That's goes into the other opposite end of the spectrum, where you 
affiliated with with the identity of the oppressed and we can cannot see any other way of being. So that's why I think um, if you know that you are being then you can create a world. But if you are in the state of identity motion, you're not even aware that you are being in the state of subjugation. Right? You need to work well, someone who need to show you how to create that awareness for you. That is one 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 way how we can maybe overcome the crisis as you described earlier. And then the the question from your team, the role of the program, the role of Finland University and Sukhan. Maybe I need to um, give you a more descriptions about the program. So the the institution of partners was uh, Finland University. It was a consortium between Agra University. Uh, I think there are is yeah. Is uh, Finland University, and there are four or five universities at that time who created this consortium. And they offer a program for a master degree program uh, to other institutions. And Suma Foundation at that time was interested. And then um, we decided to create a collaboration to implement the program in Indonesia, but the degree is from down there. So Ampere University is the implemented partner, and the program is based on their own master degree program that was implemented in Finland. So the the whole curriculum is based on their program. And there was I think 120 ECTS you know, European credit transfer, and it, the duration is about 17 to 18 months. Uh, the the lecturer goes to Indonesia every month. Um, so we have different courses. The teachers are all stay in one school, so they're not teaching, but they're just studying for the duration of 18 years. Um, we organize all the teaching and learning in one of the schools in Biren, Aceh, and then they also have a study visit in Finland for uh, um, two months, and they also we also did the graduation ceremony here. So all the curriculum are based on master degree program that was implemented in Tampere um, University. Uh, and they are also the issuing institution for the degree. Yeah. It's just the organization of the learning happening in two countries. And then, um, yeah, that's how <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, I think, they did similar collaboration with other country. I think with uh, Saudi Arabia. It's a, it's a shorter program. I think it was six months, not a degree, but rather more like a certification. So there are different programs that they offer at that time. But uh, the consortium ended. Uh, so Finland University is no longer uh, offering this program. So now the university are doing their own program so i think that's if you are interested to create some sort of collaboration then i will suggest that you uh you approach from the university say in Finland. Mm -hmm. i think they they have what they call the um, the collaboration or the partnership um, division in policy in company in the university Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. I think uh, we can conclude this session and thank you all for the participation. And yeah, we can give a round of applause to the participants. Thank you again, Dr. Sabia. And then, uh, yeah, before we end this session, we will have a souvenir giving. Will be delivered by Dr. Tati. Okay. And then followed by photo session. I think uh, we have this background first and then that background.
Thank you guys for the party. And yeah. Uh, next, we will have a photo session. I think we, we will have uh, this background first. Yeah. Uh, those are uh, behind. You can go forward to to make it in the picture. I think I have to go to this slide. Okay. So you can it, please. Take your positions, guys. Okay, three, three, one. Thank you very much for this, your kind attention and participation. We will see you again in the next live talk conducted by the Faculty of Education. Thank you very much. Thank you.